The Jenkins Orphanage Bands, The Story of Many During the late 19th and early 20th century, the tragedy of homelessness had a profound effect on African-American children in South Carolina. Fortunately, the Jenkins Orphanage was established in South Carolina. The children there learned to be self-sufficient, and through music, some of those children found a successful career and became renowned musicians. The Reverend Daniel Joseph Jenkins was born into slavery in 1862 in Barnwell, South Carolina. Not much is known about Reverend Jenkins' early life, but those close to him were told that he had been forced out of the plantation where he had been born and had moved to Arkansas as a young man. Before he was a reverend, Daniel Jenkins came back to South Carolina where he met and married Lena James. Jenkins earned his living by hauling timber for the lumber mills. One day, Jenkins went to the railroad yard to retrieve a consignment of wood. While there, he stumbled upon four young black boys huddled together in a boxcar. When he asked them why their parents had let them come outside on such a cold day, he learned that they had been abandoned. Though he had children of his own already, and precious little money with which to take care of them, he took the orphaned boys home to his wife. He gave them food and beds, but soon realized that the problem of abandoned black youth in Charleston was gargantuan, severely bigger than the orphans he had taken in. Daniel Jenkins was sure that his meeting of the boys in the railroad car was no coincidence. He believed that he had been chosen for a higher purpose, to be a missionary to the thousands of unwanted black children who didn't have anything to their names or anyone to take care of them. The fact that because the African American children living on the streets of Charleston had no one other than themselves to take care of each other is a heartbreaking truth. Though the background of these children is an undeniable tragedy, the real tragedy of this story is that prior to 1891, there was not a single orphanage that took black children in South Carolina. The reason being is that during the 1800s, segregation was ubiquitous. There were no laws against it yet, and many facilities utilized segregation as racism was prevalent. Prior to 1891, the streets were the only home for abandoned black orphans to live in. Providentially, from the predicament of the young boys found in the boxcar by Daniel Joseph Jenkins, came the haven of an association for black children where there hadn't been one before. Because they di couldn't support themselves any other way, oftentimes the impoverished orphans resorted to stealing to secure their needs. This was a problem for the city of Charleston, but that's where Daniel Jenkins stepped in. After church on the same Sunday of Jenkins' discovery of the four orphaned boys, the Reverend made an appeal to the mayor and city officials of Charleston with a speech inspired by his sermon from service about starting an association to help all black orphans. He piqued their interest by saying that he would take the thieving orphans off the street. He was granted a hundred dollars and a building at 660 King Street that was little more than a shed. The shed on 660 King Street quickly proved too small a place for the growing orphanage. Ever the articulate businessman, Jenkins persuaded the South Carolina Medical School to let him use the old Marine Hospital on 20 Franklin Street. The Marine Hospital was not only in the penal district, but it was next door to the city jail. And while it made for some unpleasant noise such as shouted obscenities and harsh yelling, it also served as a reminder and enforcer to the children of the Jenkins Orphanage that they would end up there if they didn't heed the Reverend's rules and warnings. Around the same time, Reverend Jenkins found out that some of the homeless kids who got caught stealing were sent to a reformatory school, so he would go to court and ask that the judge place the children in his care. This turned out to work smoothly, as the Reverend instilled morals into the children and taught them how to live and earn a living. However, as the number of orphans continued to grow, Reverend Jenkins realized that he needed something to sustain the orphanage. It is speculated that the Reverend got inspiration from the Fisk Jubilee Singers of Nashville. In addition, having on his hands a number of undernourished, rickety, and tuberculous youngsters, Jenkins optimistically decided my children's lungs would get strong by blowing wind instruments. With this, Jenkins organized 11 to 12 of the orphan boys into a band. He hired two local musicians to teach them to read music and because of the group instruction, each band member became proficient at playing all the instruments that were donated to the orphanage. When the boys' skills satisfied Reverend Jenkins, he took them onto the streets of Charleston where they performed with a vivacious, flowing energy 
like electrical currents crisscrossing in the air. The orphans, who Reverend Jenkins often called his black lambs, always had their concerts in with the Reverend, going through the crowd, collecting donations. The donations from one concert would typically feed the orphans for a week. The feet of the Jenkins Orphanage Band, whom newspapers gave a condescending moniker, the Piccaninny Band, was not the first of its kind. While the insult from newspapers didn't fly over Jenkins' head, he adopted it because he figured it would elicit donations from white audiences. The idea of marching bands was found all throughout the country, however it was not the music of the band, but how they played it, that captured the attention of passerby and audiences. The band would normally lead their concerts with a Sousa march, a standard part of the regimental band repertoire. From here, they'd ease into a cakewalk, a high-kicking, strutting parody of the formal ballroom dances of the white elite. One could hear that the boys played and danced with the urgent intensity born of their need to live free and prosper. Despite coming from less than humble beginnings, some of Reverend Jenkins' black lambs went from rags to renowned. Short-term impacts of the Jenkins Orphanage Band were the introduction of ragtime, the experience for an individual touring with the band, and an international reputation. One short-term impact is that the Jenkins Orphanage Piccaninny Band is associated with helping introduce and popularize ragtime. The band's unique feat that set them apart from all the others doing the same act was the way they abandoned the neat harmonic structures of the standard tunes and played them in a new style, characterized by highly staccato rhythms, a lot of minor chords, and virtuosic solo performances. This new ragtime music was such an unusual deviation that it was received with shocking confusion. According to JenkinsInstitute.org, the crowds, initially bewildered, gradually succumbed to the band's charming musical comradeship and nimble talent. An irresistible gimmick of the reverence was to have the band's smallest boy be the conductor of the band and wear a hat three sizes too big, conducting with a baton the length of his own arm. The Jenkins Orphanage Band had lasting effects as well. Some long-term impacts of the Piccaninny Band were the experience of live performances was gifted, renowned musicians were churned out periodically, and last but most certainly not least, the introduction of the Charleston Dance. Musicians such as Freddie Green, Jabo Smith, Cat Anderson, Tom Delaney, Gigi Fields, Peanuts Holland, Speedy Jones, and many, many more went on to lead successful careers. Freddie Green joined and played lead guitar in the Count Basie Orchestra for 50 years. Jabo Smith, who got his start in the Orphanage Band, would later vie with Louis Armstrong for the title of Jazz Virtuoso in Trumpet Playing. Cat Anderson was arguably the greatest high-note trumpeteer of all time, and was more than just a high-note player, being a master with mutes and having a fine tone in lower registers. Tom Delaney, Geechee Fields, Peanuts Holland, and Speedy Jones played the piano, trombone, drums, and trumpet with the likes of Jelly Roll Morton, Coleman Hawkins, Fletcher Henderson, Duke Ellington, Dizzy Gillespie, and Red Allen. Jenkins Orphanage Band is credited with creating the dance named after its place of birth, the Charleston. Julie Hubbard is a music historian at USC. While there is controversy surrounding who first showcased the Charleston, she traces the origins back to the Gola African American community who lived in parts of Georgia and South Carolina. Hubbard describes how the Jenkins Band would perform Geechee songs accompanied by dancing wherever they went, including in Harlem. She surmises that this exposed other musicians to this unique musical and dance form. The of a lifetime when he saw four orphan African American boys huddled in a boxcar. The Jenkins Orphanage gave young African American boys not only another chance at a better life, but a chance to become successful by introducing them to music. These boys being introduced to music had a bigger impact on the community than just on them. The Jenkins Orphanage band remained popular for around a decade before social security provoked the orphanage's steady decline. Single mothers weren't forced to abandon their children and a bank collapse caused detriment to the orphanage's funds. Today, the renamed Jenkins Institute is located along the Ashley River and cares for eight girls.